We'll wait with anticipation. I'd like to welcome everyone who's joining us via live stream right now. This is only one part of our service here at Chelsea Community Church with City Temple. If you want to be part of the whole thing via Zoom, drop us an email. We'll send you the details. Or you can come and join us here at Chelsea Community Church on Sunday mornings at 11 a.m. If you have your Bibles, let's turn to two places. First of all, to Matthew chapter 24, and then to 2 Timothy chapter 4. Matthew 24, 2 Timothy chapter 4. And before we read, let's pray. Gracious God, thank you so much for the Bible. I thank you that it is trustworthy and true. And I pray by your Holy Spirit that you'd speak it into our hearts today. Use it to encourage us and strengthen us for the glory and honor of Jesus. And I pray, Lord God, that your Holy Spirit would rest on me, that I could bring your word to your people today, boldly and faithfully, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. In Matthew chapter 24, Jesus is talking to his disciples, starting with verse 3. As Jesus sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? And Jesus answered them, See that no one leads you astray. For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ. And they will lead many astray. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not alarmed, for this must take place, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are but the beginning of the birth pains. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and put you to death, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another. And many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. And because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. And then over to 2 Timothy chapter 4. Paul's talking to his spiritual son, Timothy. And he says, I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. As for you, always be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. May God bless to us this reading from his holy word. Man, what an incredible week that we've seen here. I mean, of course, we've got the whole backdrop of the war in Ukraine and all the things that are going on there and the threat of a global famine and all the, the drama of the, this latest G20 gathering of nations. But you had, uh, earlier in the week, the mass shooting in Chicago on uh, American Independence Day, which, if you didn't know, was the 100th mass shooting in the United States since the mass shooting on the 24th of May in Uvalde, Texas, at the primary school there. 100 mass shootings in that little space of time. You had Shinzo Abe who was brashly assassinated in the streets there in Japan, something completely unheard of in Japan. You had uh, the storming 
of the presidential palace in Sri Lanka and the burning of the prime minister's residence there in Sri, Sri Lanka. And of course, for those of us here in the United Kingdom, we had something I, I don't think any of us ever thought we'd see, the resignation of Boris Johnson as prime minister. I tell you, I thought the guy was gonna fight on. Uh, I really did. Uh, and uh, and I, I have to admit, I have mixed feelings. Uh, parts of me liked Boris Johnson, other parts of me didn't really didn't like him, and, but it's given me mixed feelings. And, uh, and I think one of the takeaways from the Prime Minister's resignation speech uh, was really important for us to hear. He said, I quote, the herd instinct is powerful, and when the herd moves, it moves. And let me tell you right now, we're in a world where the herd instinct is dominating in a lot of different ways. And we're seeing it all around us. And our world is experiencing tremendous and terrible turmoil, which if you recall is exactly what I prophesied was coming back at the beginning of this year. I said, we're gonna have terrible turmoil. We're gonna have tremendous turmoil. It's gonna be coming and we've been experiencing that. And it's gonna get worse before it gets better. Please understand, it's gonna get worse before it gets better, especially as the herd instinct takes hold. When you've got times of turmoil, the herd becomes easily controllable. Uh, and if you wanna see a, a story about how easily that can happen, uh, we watched this, uh, this series called The Undeclared War, which sadly I cannot recommend unless you have a fast forward button. But if you have a fast forward button, there's a couple of very, very powerful scenes in that to show how easily people are manipulated. And I see that in our world today. I see that even in the church of Jesus Christ. And it's happening a lot. It's happening all around us. So we have a lot of turmoil. We're having a lot of trouble. And as Christians, I think we are at a moment of incredible danger. We're in a, a time of incredible danger. There's, we're surrounded by a number of dangers. But we are also entering a season of extraordinary opportunities. There's a lot of dangers right now. But there are going to be a lot of opportunities for us as Christians. And so we need to recognize some of these dangers. Now, obviously, I can't tell you all the dangers because that would take way too long, but I'm gonna identify some of the big dangers that Christians are facing right now. I'm gonna identify our opportunities and, and I'm going to tell you how to maximize your ability to avoid the dangers and take advantage of the opportunities. And again, I'm not gonna be comprehensive about this, but we need to understand it's a season of great dangers, but also we're coming into a season of tremendous opportunity and a season where I'm praying, we're all praying that God will pour out his spirit in the biggest great awakening this world has seen since the 1700s. That's what I'm looking for. And I don't wanna stop with anything less. So even though we're surrounded by dangers, I'm not afraid. And I'm looking forward to the opportunities because it's gonna be a lot of fun, even though it's gonna be hard. So let me tell you about some of the dangers. Danger number one, identified by Jesus there in that passage we read, danger number one is being led astray. Christians are facing the danger of being led astray today like no other time in history. It's like no other time in history. And I've read church history. I know. Like no other time in history. Jesus said that there are going to be many people who are going to proclaim Jesus, who are going to say that Jesus is the Christ. That's what he means. He's not saying that there were going to be people that were going to come and say, I am the Christ. They're saying that they would come up and say, Jesus is the Christ, but they would be leading people astray. 
A, fact, a figure I came across this week, uh, every year a uh, university in the United States does uh, a survey that they call uh, the Worldview Survey, the World Christian Worldview Survey uh, for 2022, and it looks at pastors primarily. And according to this year's Christian Worldview Survey, only 37% of pastors in the United States hold a Christian worldview. Let that sink in. Only 37%. That number is quite a bit lower in mainline denominations, uh, such as the Presbyterian Church, USA. But only 37%. Largely, Christian pastors are following kind of a, a Christian deism or theism where, okay, there's a God, but their whole approach is not biblical at all. Now, you think, oh, that's, that's pretty bad. Well, I was watching an interview this week with a guy named John Cooper, who is the, the lead of a band called Skillet. And if you like heavy metal music, they're great. You know, you look them up, uh, Skillet's really good. Their latest album really solid, uh, turn it up, crank it up, especially if you've got neighbors who like classical music, just crank that thing up as loud as you can go. John Cooper uh, was saying in the interview, now this is a man's estimate, but as an insider in the Christian music industry, and as an insider, a well thought of insider for more than, for about uh, more than 20 years, uh, probably about 25 years now in Christian music, his estimate, is that only 30% of Christian musicians and worship leaders in the United States have a Christian worldview, have a biblical worldview. Only 30%. And I believe it because of what I'm seeing coming out. Now, if you've got your pastors and your worship leaders with a minority of them holding a biblical worldview that is a biblical view of life and how to live life and, and who Jesus is and all that thing. Uh, and you only have 37% and only 30% of your worship leaders who are writing the worship songs right now that are being sung are writing from a biblical perspective. Let me tell you, Christians are being led astray. And the situation in the United Kingdom is not better. The situation around the world is not better. You have to go some places in Africa, it might be a bit better. Some places in Asia, it's gonna be a bit better, but not most places in the West, some places in South America. But what's happening in the States is filtering around. How much of the worship music that's being sung today around the world is generated in the West? And this is happening. So danger number one is being led astray. Jesus said, too, that many false prophets would arise to lead people astray. Let me tell you, these false prophets are operating on the internet and on public television and such in, in pulpits right now. And if you want to know who they are, mark what they say and how they say it. You know, is what they're saying coming true? And also, mark who they're pointing to. Are they bringing glory to themselves? Are they bringing glory to Jesus? A lot of these folks are not bringing glory to Jesus. Yet, the testimony of Jesus, according to the scriptures, is the spirit of prophecy. All prophecy should point to Jesus. It's not. Now, Jesus goes on to say, you know, that because of the, there's problems, and there's going to be global crises and wars and rumors of wars, you know what? The global crises and problems are leading many people astray. I've seen a lot of Christians who are saying, well, you know, I, I, I just can't believe that a good God would let all this bad stuff happen, so, you know, I'm going to quit. Without looking at what the Bible says about it and giving up. You know, they get offended because of their expectation that's not set by the scriptures, but set by their feelings. Or they get really anxious because of all that's going on and they try to fix it themselves. And we get caught up in all these human-centered solutions. Uh, the slow driving that was happening, was that, was that this week? You know, to protest fuel, we're gonna clog up the motorways and drive slow and use up a lot of fuel. 
I mean, come on, people. Let's think through this and have a better idea about what needs to happen. A lot of people are going astray. Trouble and persecution, Jesus said, was going to lead many astray, especially if people think it's supposed to be easy to be a Christian. There's a lot of people who become Christians and say, hey, my life has to get better. But let me tell you, sometimes you become a Christian, your life gets worse. But at least it's not your afterlife. You know, your afterlife gets better. It goes from heaven uh, to heaven from hell. Uh, so that's better, even if life here gets a little bit worse for a time. So that's a big danger is being led astray. And that is a huge danger today with Christians. And I'm seeing it all around me. I'm seeing it in leaders. And I'm seeing it in people in churches. Uh, and, uh, and it's happening. It's happening everywhere. Danger number two is a bit harsher than being led astray. Danger number two is actually falling away. Jesus said that there would be some that fell away. Some who would reject the faith. Now, I don't know if these persons were ever Christians. A lot of people go into ministry, for example, uh, because they feel good. Maybe their parents let them, or, uh, or they like church and the idea of church, not because they're called by God. I've seen that over the years. So, uh, but there are many people that are just completely falling away. They're rejecting Christ. The, the headlines have been for the last couple of years. A number of high-profile leaders have simply rejected Jesus. Many others have fallen away in terrible sin, some of which has been hidden for most of their life. There's a real movement that's going on right now, people talking about, I'm deconstructing my faith, which in many cases means I'm rejecting it and just taking the little bits that I like. They're falling away. Uh, there are people who are just rejecting completely the Bible as God's word. And that's a massive danger right now. Not as big a danger as being led astray. Not everybody who's led astray will fall away. But whether you're led astray or you fall away, it can really mess with your life, especially your life in Jesus. Danger number three, according to Jesus, is that your love grows cold. And I'm seeing this a lot. It's hard, isn't it? Because we all got so much stuff and so, much, so many things that we have to deal with. And it's very easy for our love to grow cold. Now, by the way, by love, you all know that I'm not talking about romantic love. I'm not talking about sentimentality. I'm not talking about, oh, Lucina, I love you, man. You're just so beautiful. I just love you. Oh, Rod, I love you back. You know, it's not, we're not talking about that kind of thing. You know, love is a zealous, self-giving commitment to others for their benefit. That's what love's all about. Whether it's your kids or whether it's your brothers and sisters in Christ, that's love. And Jesus says, because of lawlessness, the love of many, and he's talking about followers, the love of many will grow cold. And we're seeing that right now. And it's all because of lawlessness. Now, what is lawlessness? Lawlessness is not obeying or, or following the Bible. That's one expression of it. People say, well, you know, I, I, I'm free from all this. I don't have to deal, with, deal with, with any of this. You know, I can just sleep with whomever. You know, God doesn't care. That's kind of a lawlessness. Uh, also, another form of lawlessness is a lack of discipline in your life. You know, you're not controlling your finances. You're not controlling your sleep patterns, your eating, whatever it is. You're not showing discipline. You're not doing your work with excellence. That's a form of lawlessness. A lack of focus in your life. You're not going in the direction that God's called you to go is a form of lawlessness. Dealing with pride in your life. Pride is a big form of lawlessness because you assume that you're right. So you don't have to listen to anybody else. Uh, refusing to submit to others. Rebellion is another form of lawlessness. I know people who won't commit to a church. You know, it's like, well, no, I'm not called to commit to that church. I, I'm, I'm supposed to go to, from church to church to bless them. That's just a form of lawlessness. And we need to understand what it is. It's not love. It's lawlessness, and it's sin. 
it's sin. Uh, or using, trying to use power to get your way is another form of lawlessness. And if you have lawlessness, you won't have love. Your, lo your love will always grow cold. Then there's a fourth danger, and it's what I call itching ear syndrome. It's what Paul points out uh, when he's talking to, to Timothy, the itching ear syndrome. Uh, and the itching ear syndrome is in part, it's not esteeming and learning from healthy teaching. And what Paul's talking here to Timothy about this itching ear syndrome, he said, you know, the time is coming when people are not gonna put up with sound or healthy teaching. Uh, and put up with that whole idea behind this is that people are not going to learn. People are not going to learn. Uh, it's something I've seen over time. We've done the, the Freedom in Christ course at City Temple for a number of years. We've just embraced it here at Chelsea Community Church uh, and we'll be offering it in the autumn. And it's such a great course. And we use it and we encourage people to go through it multiple times, it's really good. And, uh, and I remember a number of years ago, I had somebody come up to me and they were sharing some issues in their, in their life with me. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, I said to the person, I said, well, you know, it, it sounds like that maybe you could be helped by going through the Freedom in Christ course. You know, that could really bless you. And the person looked at me and said, oh, I, I've already done that. And then I wanted to yell at the person, I didn't, but I wanted to say to the person, then why aren't you living it? You know, we have access to so much teaching and so much instruction, yet so few people are actually living it out. That's a problem. That's a problem. It's part of the itching ear syndrome. And we need uh, teaching that's biblically healthy, that is, it's based in the scriptures. It's historically healthy. That is, it's in line with historic, the way Christians have thought throughout the last 2,000 years. You know, one of the men I admire, a guy named Thomas Oden, who's gone to be with the Lord, he said, he's a theologian, and he said before he died, he said, you know, I want it written on my tombstone, he added nothing to theology. Because you know what? There's nothing that we can say today that hasn't been said. And it's true, we just haven't found it. So it needs to be historically healthy, and it needs to be personally healthy. That means coming out of sound teachers. So you need to get to know the person to make sure they're healthy. Now what people with the itching ear syndrome, they tend to do, they will start accumulating teachers to suit their own interests and perspectives, to suit their own passions. So they'll say, oh, I don't like that church. The pastor offended me one Sunday, so I'm gonna go to this church because the pastor never offends me. You know, that's itching ear syndrome. We don't make the commitment. We just gather around us people who will agree with us. And uh, it's really easy to do right now. If you don't like what somebody says, I guarantee you, you'll find something on the internet to disagree with them. Pardon me, sorry about that. Uh, and it's a problem that every teacher right now, not everyone, but many of them, is trying to make his or her mark or draw attention to themselves, often by saying something in a humorous way or, or a, a unique way or a different way. And they're just trying to draw attention to themselves to get a following, to build a brand, to build a platform, and that's not healthy. And it means that sometimes people are emphasizing things that should not be emphasized. Another dynamic of this itching ear syndrome is where people turn away from the whole truth and they wander off into myths. Now, a lot of times when we think about what Paul is saying here, we think he's talking about people who at one point in time, they believe that Jesus died on the cross and rose from the dead. And then they wander off and they think, oh no, it wasn't really Jesus on the cross. It was something else. And there was a Christ spirit and you know all kinds of weird stuff like that. That's not usually what happens. Usually what happens is that we fix on something, fixate on something that's true and surround it with things that's not true. So that the whole package 
seems to be true when it's not. And you need to be aware of this because there are a lot of teachers right now doing this. Even historically, you look at somebody like uh, uh, Leslie Weatherhead, who was predecessor at City Temple in the mid, uh, <laughs> excuse me. Sorry about that, dust. Uh, uh, he would do that too. He'd say things that sound right, but weren't. I received an email this week from somebody I know who was asking a question. And the conclusion that they drew, it is a short email. Okay, so only about six lines or so. Uh, the conclusion that they drew in the email was exactly right. Everything else in the email was error. Some of it was serious error, and some of it was less than serious error, but everything else was error. And, and uh, in the past, uh, some of you know, I would have just replied to that, and about 10 pages later, you know, set, set, set the person straight, but then people don't learn, because most people with itching ear syndrome don't really want to learn. And it's a big issue. It's a big issue. A right conclusion based on error, let me tell you, is worse than a wrong conclusion based on truth. A right conclusion based on error is worse than a wrong conclusion based on truth. You might remember this from your maths. Uh, back when I was taking maths, which was a very long time ago with the abacus and all that. Uh, back when I was taking maths, we had to show our work. I always hated that. I didn't want to show my work. I just wanted to do it in my mind and get to the end. But you had to show your work. We had to show our work because if we got the answer wrong, but our work was right, we would get credit for it. But if we don't show the work and we come up with the wrong answer, then the whole thing is wrong. And, and that's the same way with, with our faith. The right conclusion based on error is much worse than the wrong conclusion based on truth. Because God can more easily correct the latter than the former in our hearts. Danger number five, as we've seen this week, is following the wrong leaders following the wrong leaders. I love what Paul says, 2 Corinthians chapter 11. For you gladly bear with fools, being wise yourselves. For you bear it, now they were questioning his leadership. So he says, for you bear it if someone makes slaves of you, or devours you, or takes advantage of you, or puts on airs, or strikes you in the face. To my shame, I must say, we were too weak for that. And what he did, Paul is pointing out uh, a number of different wrong leadership styles. You know, there's some people who make slaves of their followers. That is, they want you to serve them and their agenda, their needs, their ideas. Make them great. Let's make slaves of them. It's wrong. There's some people, some leaders, who will devour you. That They'll take what you have and then demand more and more of your resources, your time, your energy, your money. And sometimes they'll use that for themselves and their own benefit. Now, there's some people that will take advantage of you. And this is the emotionally manipulative leader. And by the way, we're going to start calling out emotionally manipulative leadership. We don't have many around, but there have been a few. And we're going to start calling it out uh, because it's wrong. It's where the person says, oh, you know, it, it's emotionally manipulative leadership is the advert, if you see it on TV, that has the really sick puppies, and they say, give us a, 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 a pound a week, and you can get these puppies a home. That's emotional manipulation. And it's all around us, and it's wrong. It's wrong as a leadership style. Uh, and then there are some that put on airs. They are just interested in developing their brand, uh, making themselves seem special. They focus on their image. There's a lot of pretension to be something that they're not. And then there are some leaders who strike you in the face. They use control and abuse. 
And there are many examples of this. Many of you may have heard of a guy named Mark Driscoll and, and Mars Hill Church. And he was removed from leadership and that church fell apart because there were accusations of a very controlling and dominating leadership style. But the, he's not the only one. There's been at least three this year that I've read about. And the thing is that all five of these types of leaders can build very big churches. I know very big churches that were built on guilt trips, making people feel guilty. Now I know very big churches that have built on uh, power hungry people. I know very big churches that were built because you know the guy was really popular and looked good. And these are wrong kinds of leadership and that's a real danger right now. We need to be seeking the right people to be leaders at the right time. And we need to be replacing the wrong leaders. So those are our five really big dangers. And there's a lot more. I mean, there are a lot of others we could talk about, but those are five big ones that come from our text today. And we need to watch out. Uh, and I'm deeply concerned because these right now, all of these are massive issues in the Church of Jesus Christ, in the United Kingdom, the United States, and many other places right now. All five of these dangers, and left unchecked, people will leave the faith, and churches will collapse, and churches will become ineffective. I mean, frankly, a church led by a pastor who does not have a biblical worldview is going to struggle. And there's going to be serious problems, especially if they happen to be the biggest, the wealthiest, and most popular church on the block. So we have to watch out for the dangers. But we do have opportunities. And I'm not going to go into all the opportunities, but our opportunities flow from a promise that Jesus made. And this is the promise. He said, the gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world before the end comes. That's the promise. And I remember back uh, 30, 40 years ago, the mentality of Christians was, oh, Jesus is going to come again soon, so let's get as many people saved as we can. Let's get them in the bunker together. Uh, and so uh, when Jesus comes, at least they'll be saved, and we'll, we'll save ourselves from this terrible world that's going to hell in a handbasket. And now our world is really going to hell in a handbasket. Uh, but that is not a biblical mentality. Jesus says before he comes again, the gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed in the whole world. And then he comes. Now guess who is going to proclaim the gospel of the kingdom in the whole world? It's us. It's the church. It's the body of Christ. That's Jesus' promise. And that promise opens up many opportunities. And the proclamation of Jesus' promise uh, involves not only words, but also deeds. We're going to see an increase of miracles. We're going to see an increase of healing. We're going to see an increase of mighty works of God as the gospel of the kingdom is proclaimed in all the earth, especially with the boldness. In gospel, the, the, the proclamation involves the church. It's us that will be the proclaimers in all of this. And the kingdom that we proclaim is the kingdom of Jesus' loving rulership. The fact that Jesus is the King of kings and Lord of lords who died on the cross for our sins, who rose bodily from the dead on the third day, who ascended into heaven and is coming again to right all the wrongs in this world and establish God's rulership over this planet. That is the gospel that we're proclaiming. The gospel of the kingdom is that the church of Jesus Christ will be a pure and holy and victorious bride of Christ when Jesus comes again. He doesn't come again to clean us up. He comes again after we've been cleaned up. We've made ourselves ready. That is the promise that we have and all our opportunities flow from that. 
In other words, I think we're entering a season right now where our opportunity is really being the church for the world that God has called us to be. But it won't happen if we don't avoid those dangers. It won't happen if you fall away, if you're led astray. It won't happen if you got itching ear syndrome. It won't happen if you're following the wrong leader. And there needs to be a judgment, as Peter says, that begins with the house of God right now to deal with leadership in the body of Christ. And that will be happening, that will be coming. So the question then for us is how do you avoid the dangers and take advantage of the opportunities? How do we do this? What's the counsel? What's the guidance here? And Paul gives us some very clear things, what he told Timothy there uh, very clearly. He said, Timothy, you be sober-minded. Be sober-minded. What does that mean? It means to be alert, focused, and self-controlled. Your focus determines your life. Do you know that? Your focus determines your life. Your focus determines the direction of your life. What you choose to focus on, what you choose to pay attention to, makes all the difference. And if you don't understand that, offer to ride with me in the Scottish Highlands sometime. Because in the Scottish Highlands and some of the curvy roads, I like to look at the mountains while I'm driving. And, uh, and, and it's great, you know, even though my car is older, it has one of those, uh, those uh, alarms where you go outside the, the lane. You know, you know those alarms in cars? You know, mine's usually sitting next to me and it's, Rod, Rod, look out, watch out, Rod, Rod. You know, and if I'm not careful and focus on the road, I can have an accident. That's the same true with your life. That's what Paul is saying when he says, be sober-minded, be clear-headed, focused, and self-controlled. You don't have to go after everything. You don't have to let people control you. Be self-controlled. And then he says, endure suffering. And normally when we say, he says endure suffering, we think of endurance in a normal sense. We're gonna to get to that in a moment. That's not really what he's saying here with these words. But when he says endure suffering, he says, he's saying embrace hardship and struggle and difficulty as a normal part of your life in Christ. Just embrace it. If you find hardship and struggle and difficulty, it's a normal part of living in Christ Jesus. It's a normal part of life. You know, just get on with it. But especially if you're a Christian, hardship, struggle, and difficulty, it's going to be there. So embrace it. That's what Paul is saying here. Then he says, do the work of, the, of an evangelist. What he's meaning here, you know, not all of us are evangelists. There's some that say, yeah, we're all, we're all evangelists. No, we're not. Uh, we don't all have the gift of evangelism. But we are all called to share Jesus with others. And that's what Paul, Timothy wasn't an evangelist. But Paul says, Paul, G, Timothy, don't forget, do the work of an evangelist. In other words, share the good news with people every chance you get. And make sure it's good news. Frankly, we have to be done with a condemnatory form of evangelism. With a repent, you sinners, kind of evangelism. Now, people are sinners, don't get me wrong, and they have to repent, don't get me wrong. But you know what the Bible says? It's God's kindness that leads us to repentance. And it's the kindness of Christians that will lead people to repentance, and it's our kindness in telling the good news about Jesus that will make all the difference. Because this world get, needs to get on to the bad news. The bad news is Extinction Rebellion is not going to fix the climate. The bad news is that NATO is not going to deal with Russian aggression once and for all. The bad news is that the prime minister we elect is not going to correct the inflation issue. The bad news is 
that no matter who is in leadership or who is in power is going to deal with the sin problem that is affecting communities. The bad news is that gun laws in the United States or in England or wherever is not going to correct gun violence, even if you're in favor of gun laws, as I am. The good news is Jesus. And the good news is that following Jesus, there's an answer for the climate problems. There's an answer for the global uh, pandemic. There's an answer for the global famine. There's an answer for the war in Ukraine. There's an answer for who should be prime minister. There's an answer to all these things, but it's only found in Jesus, and it's only found if we understand that Jesus is not the castor oil that we have to drink to release us in some way. Jesus is not the, the bitter pill that we have to swallow to get healthy in some way, that Jesus is the good news. And so we have to share the good news of Jesus as good news. And then Paul says to Timothy, fulfill your ministry. And that simply means serve to the fullest as God's called you to serve. You know why you're in a church? You shouldn't be in a church because of what you get. Your primary calling to any church is how could God use me to serve? And if you see that, it's not wrong to get from the church, and hopefully we all will. But I have to tell you, there have been times in my life where I've gone years receiving nothing and giving everything. But then God makes it up with some other times. So we have to serve to the fullest as God has called us to serve. And Jesus said there at the end of his passage, and those who endure to the end will be saved. And so the last thing to beware the dangers and take advantage of the opportunities is we need to develop and maintain an endurance mentality. I'm going to keep going. A number of years ago, my mom did something very good for me. Uh, there was a pastor in, the, in St. Louis where I grew up, a large, large Presbyterian church there, who was in Colorado hiking, had a fall, and ended up losing his leg, had an amputation. And uh, a few months after that, he killed himself, uh, which obviously was devastating for the church. Uh, and uh, he couldn't handle that. And my mom looked at me. Uh, this was my mom who said that she would never go to a church where I was the pastor. How could a guy's mom say that? I said, Mom, you know, why would you not go to a church where I'm the pastor? And she said, because I'd never, I never want to hear people talk about you the way they talk about my pastor. <laughs> well, she still could have come. That's okay. I don't mind how people talk about me. Uh, but, uh, but she looked at me after this thing happened, and she said, Rod, promise me that no matter how hard it gets, you'll never kill yourself. And of course, the thought had never entered my mind, but I said, I promise you, Mom. I promise. You know, I'm not going to quit. I'm not going to kill myself. I'm not going to give up. And I'm tempted to sometimes. There's a lot of times, and a lot of the stuff we've been through, you know, you just want to go and hide in a corner somewhere. But we don't do that. We keep going, and we keep going. And the only way that I could keep going for all the years that I've been a pastor and go through all the stuff that I've gone through is from the beginning, I've developed an endurance mentality. I am going to be one of those who endure to the end and be saved, or I'll die trying. I am going to endure to the end. I'm not going to quit. I love that line from Galaxy Quest, if you're a science fiction fan, a great film from the 90s, and the theme was, never give up, never surrender. I love that, or I love the, the uh, Robert Schuller in the Crystal Cathedral that uh, he would, uh, every Sunday he'd come out, and I got to see him many years ago. Uh, in many ways, I wasn't a fan, but uh, I really loved it. He'd come out and he'd say, tough times never last, but tough people do. I thought, that's good. I like that. You could trademark it. I think he did. But, uh, but that's it. We have to develop an endurance mentality. 
And the thing is that God has given us everything we need to avoid the dangers and maximize the opportunities. Because not only has he told us what the dangers are, I mean, it's one of the great things about the Bible that what Peter said, what Jesus said, what Paul said is coming true right now. To me, if somebody tells me what's going to happen 2,000 years in advance, that's pretty amazing. You know, it's coming through. It's happening right now. It's coming to pass. Yes, and, and many other things. And so God, you know, not only has told us in advance what these kinds of challenges are, he's given us the Bible to guide us, you know, so that we don't have to get guidance from some mystical place. He's put the Holy Spirit inside of us to help us to know the truth and to live the truth and to do the truth and the whole truth and nothing but the truth. And he's lavished his grace on us so that no matter how many times you fall down, no matter how many times you mess up, you pick yourself up and you keep going. You keep enduring. You keep pressing ahead. Because we're going to see amazing things. Just like I told you six months ago that we're going to see times of turmoil and it's going to be pretty significant. I'm telling you now, we're going to see a season of opportunity and that we as a church right now are in a season of opportunity that's going to continue to grow and escalate into the autumn where God is going to do great things and draw many people to Jesus. And that's our promise. Let's pray. Lord God, we love you and we honor you and we worship you. And we thank you for your word. I pray, Lord, that you'd solidify it in our hearts. Lord, I pray that you'd show us these dangers and keep us ever mindful of them. Even as we look forward to the opportunities you give us. And when those opportunities come, Lord, whether it's at work tomorrow or next week or at home or on the streets, let us step into them and take advantage of them for the glory and honor of Jesus. For we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, let's stand and join in singing our closing song of worship. <clears throat>